Grazie. No, effettivamente noi comunità scientifica qualche problema con i nomi ce l'abbiamo, ma non soltanto per la morte termica o il gas del genere. Quando abbiamo costruito un telescopio molto grande in Cile, per esempio, costituito da quattro telescopi, ciascuno con uno specchio primario di 8 metri, l'abbiamo chiamato con un acronimo inglese che è VLT. T sta per telescope, VL sta per very large, molto grande. Telescopio molto grande. Abbiamo costruito un telescopio molto grande e l'abbiamo chiamato telescopione. Va bene? Va bene. Secondo la teoria della relatività generale di Einstein, noi siamo immersi in uno spazio-tempo. Bene, questo spazio-tempo non è rigido, è deformabile. Che cosa lo può deformare? Una massa dell'energia che lo percorre, che lo attraversa. Ed essendo deformabile, in certe condizioni, le deformazioni possono propagarsi. Queste sono le onde gravitazionali. Bene, io conosco gente che non ha mai creduto che le onde gravitazionali potessero essere rivelate. Abbiamo l'onore, il privilegio e il piacere di ospitare invece qui una persona che ha pensato che non soltanto si potessero rivelare le onde gravitazionali, ma ha convinto una comunità intera, insieme ad altri colleghi naturalmente, a costruire uno strumento, gli strumenti per farlo. Abbiamo con noi Ray Weiss, premio Nobel per la fisica nel 2017, per il contributo. Yeah. Hey. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, this is to your form. Thank you. Thank you for you. Per il contributo fondamentale alla costruzione di LIGO e per aver rivelato le onde gravitazionali. Ah. Well. That was a very hard act to follow. At least that's what they would say in the United States. And I needed a translator, so all I heard was Cosmology and pasta, somehow, right? Okay. Um, and I want to tell you about gravitational waves as an example of what the Shechrenkov telescope array will be part of, and that is indeed, you've heard the, t the term before, multi-messenger astronomy. And in my little talk to you, I hope I can show you a very pretty example of multi-messenger astronomy that happened to all of us About a, year and a, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, and I'll get to that in the middle of my talk. But first, I want to say a little bit motivating what is gravitational wave, what are gravitational wave astronomy, and what, is gravi what are gravitational waves. So let me turn immediately and see if this, first of all, let's see if my pointer works. Let's try it. Ah, good. It worked. Uh, anyway, the, all the gravity that most of us know uh, comes from what we learned in high school and probably in college courses on Newton's gravity. And Newton's gravity is uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful ex explanation of what goes on on the Earth seems to also go on in the heavens. It's a wonderful synthesis that was made and had a lot of historical and actually even religious experiences. But uh, Einstein later on had some trouble with using Newton's physics to explain certain things in gravity and two of them where one of them was that it didn't work for very, very large velocities when things go very fast, and it didn't have a news function in it. In other words, a thing that gave information that was at the, no faster than the speed of light. In other words, for example, in Newton, as interpreted later by people who did Newton, probably not as intelligently as Newton himself, is if you have the Earth and you suddenly pluck the Earth, I mean, have the sun, and you pluck the Earth, the sun away from the Earth, it would take something like nine minutes for you to know that. Now, if you calculate in Newton's theory what happens when you have the er orbit of the Earth going around the sun, in Newton's theory, many people would have interpreted that if you pluck the sun away, immediately the, the Earth would go off on a tangent. And that cannot be true, because it has to take at least nine minutes, even in gravitational physics, for the Earth to know that the sun is no longer there. And that is the beginning of what a gravitational wave is. And now Einstein, in 1916, actually wrote a paper after he developed the theory of general relativity, which replaced Newton's theory by having a relationship between the geometry and the ge geometry of space and the way 
things. Time is measured, both space and time, how they are measured. They are now in the new theory that Einstein made related to the distribution, distribution of matter and energy in the universe. In other words, in Einstein's theory, there is no more a gravitational force, at least in the way he interpreted it. And there is a distortion of space and a distortion of time due to the mass distribution. And now I want to show you what the gravitational wave looks like so you will have some image of why and how one detects it and why it becomes something that is useful. So here on the screen, and let me pull out another pointer, I have another thing that I need from here, is uh, I hope you can see this. If you can't, can you, can you everybody see the green? If you say, say yes if you can see it. Yeah. Ah, wonderful, good. We're worried about that. Anyway, so it turns out the sources of gravitational waves are accelerated masses, much like in electricity and magnetism, the sources of electromagnetic waves are accelerated charges. It's certain classes of motion make gravitational waves. They have to be non-spherically symmetric. In other words, things that smash into each other, they make gravitational waves. Or things that go around each other, they make gravitational waves. But things that expand uniformly, spherically, symmetrically do not wake gravitational waves. And that's something Einstein had wrong in his first paper on this thing in 1916, and then he fixed it in 1918. But in that first paper, he also told you what gravitational waves do kinematically. In other words, they propagated the speed of light. That's what he hypothesized. And as you'll see in about five or 10 minutes, we now know that exquisitely well, that indeed they propagate at the speed of light. The other kind of, the other attribute of the wave is that they're waves very much like water waves on a pond. A water wave travels in, let's say, that direction, but the excitation of the height of the water is perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is traveling. It's called a transverse wave. And that's also true of electromagnetic waves. And now I want to show you what it actually does. Now let's see if this animation works. If I hit this, let's see, ah, good, wonderful. Uh, what you're looking at is a gravitational wave that's coming out at you, you're standing right there where that red little mark is. And this is a distribution of matter that's been put out in space, and the gravitational wave, as I say, is coming to you. Now, you'll notice two things in that pattern right away. You'll notice that when there is an expansion of space, let's say, in this direction, the east-west direction, there's a contraction of space in a north-south direction. And that keeps flipping back and forth. I hope you see that. That's very important in the detection. There's some space gets stretched in one dimension and compressed in the other perpendicular direction in which the, tra the, 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 the wave is traveling. The other thing you'll notice is something as important, and that is that the two dots, let's say, next to you, here you are again, this dot and that dot, they don't move very much. But look at the dots that are very far away from you, that one and that one. They're moving an awful lot. And that's true in the other direction as well. And that is a motion that's very much like you would make if you made a rubber band with a friend of yours. You take a rubber band and put marks on it and pull it. And as you pull the rubber band and look at the way the marks are, you'll see that that is very much exactly that motion in one dimension. It's, the, it's given and expressed by the idea that it's a strain in that space. And uh, a strain is a change in the position. Let's say the change of this, mark, this point with respect to that point, how much they change, but divided by their separation. So the change in position divided by their separation is a constant at any one instant in one dimension in this picture. And that's the way you want to look at a gravitational wave. The reason why I make a big fuss about this is the instrument I'm going to quickly tell you about very shortly is an instrument that actually measures the motion of those dots and compares a motion going in this dimension and with one that goes in that dimension by using light and timing light as it leaves from here, goes out and comes back again, and then it does the same thing going in this direction. And the time will change. The time by the light spends in those two paths changes because of the gravitational wave. When that's standing still, they are, don't get changed. And so here is the guy who actually told us how difficult this all would be. This is Kip Thorne at a younger age, uh, when he was probably in his 40s, and uh, he had a fancy symbol. I don't know what that is. Many of you might know what that is. Uh, but anyway, he, he said, look, if you're ever going to succeed with measuring gravitational waves, 
you're going to have to measure h, which is this thing I just told you about. That's the strain, which is the change in length divided by the length. You're going to have to be able to measure things that are smaller than 10 to the minus 21. Now, that's a terribly small number, and many engineers who would look at that number, if you brought them the idea that you should measure such a small amount of thing, they would ask you what you've been smoking. <laughs> okay? But let's translate it into what actually had to be done. Namely, we built instruments, and there are now instruments, which I'll show you where they all are. The ones in the United States are four kilometers. The ones in Italy are three kilometers. The ones in Japan are three kilometers. But anyway, of order four kilometers, the change in length that you have to measure if you want to satisfy Kip's condition is you have to measure a motion that's 10 to the minus 18 meters big. And let me give you a feel for that. That's 1,000th the size of the nucleus of an atom. I mean, it's just infinitesimal. And that's when the engineers really will throw you out the door, okay? Uh, they'll understand that right away. And now let's, the challenge then that Kip threw at the experimenters was that if you want to measure a gravitational wave, if you want to use light to do it, you're going to have to measure 10 to the minus 12 of the wavelength of light to get a meaningful result. That's 10 to the 12 times smaller than the wavelength of the light that you're using. And that turns out to be the easier of the two problems. The other problem is you're going to have to also make measurements in an Earth that's wiggling. Right here in this room, the Earth is shaking by about 10 to the minus 6 meters. Everywhere in the world is shaking by that. There's not, no place that is shaking less than that. And so consequently, you're going to have to, to get to 10 to the minus 18, isolate the motion of whatever you're going to look at to 10 to the minus 12 of the motion of the Earth. And that's the real tall order. Okay, so this is Kip's statement of how hard it was going to be. And here is, I won't walk you through this diagram completely, but I do want to walk you through it a little bit so you will understand the nature of what was done. Okay. And um, the, so, now, to relate that picture with the dots, this device right there, which we call the beam splitter, which will be a source which will break light from this laser, break it up so half the light goes to that mirror and the other half of the light goes to that mirror. So this will be that place where I put the red square. That's where you're going to be standing. And these are the distant points that are those most distant dots. This in the y direction, that in the x direction, and down comes the gravitational wave. Now before the gravitational wave comes along, you have arranged something very interesting here. Let's not worry about these three mirrors. That, that's something we'll talk about, these four mirrors. These four mirrors are all needed to trick it up so that you can get this very high sensitivity. On the other hand, what you have now is you're going to make it so that the light spends equal time in this from here to there and from here to there. And when that is the case, no light goes to the photodetector, none. And when the gravitation wave comes down and disturbs this by pulling this guy in a little bit and pushing that guy out a little bit, that puts light at the photodetector. And that is the basis of the detection of LIGO. All these other mirrors, which I'm not going to describe, you can ask me about them in the questions later, are to enhance the ability to do that. But the basic idea is to use the laser light, split it at the, at the beam splitter, have it go down to that mirror, spend time in here, have it go through that mirror, spend time in there, and then come back to the detector. And if you see light at the detector, that means something has disturbed the system. So that's the way it works. I wish I could spend more time on that with you, but maybe if you want to ask me questions, we can, we can go a little better. So here are now the detectors that are around the world that are built on this principle. Uh, there are two in the United States. One is in the northwest corner of the United States. There's another one in the southeast. That's in Louisiana. That's in Washington State. And then there are detectors in Europe. There's a research detector in Hannover, Germany, which is about 600 meters long. These are both four kilometers long. Then there's a detector in Kashina, which is very close to Pisa, which is three kilometers long. It's, a it's probably, the, of all the sites, the prettiest one of all the sites. And then there is a detector that has just been built and is being commissioned now in the mountain, the same mountain that you heard was in which the neutrinos were detected. This is now in the, it's called Kagra, and it's in that same mountain. And they're going to try some new ideas there, especially cold things and being inside of a mountain, which might help a lot. And then there is a detector being planned in India, which is very much based on the American detectors. 
So those are the number of detectors. And now the story I'm going to tell at, for the moment is mostly associated with these two detectors because they made the initial discovery. But I do want to say a good bit about Virgo because they have made an enormous contribution also. So let's start by showing you what we detected. What we detected back in about uh, September of 2015 on a morning, early morning, was this. We saw this signal. This is the strain. And here is a number that is like Kip's number, 10 to the minus 21. And this is the signal. We'll get to that. Here is time. This is time about 0.2 seconds is from here to there. And here is a signal in Livingston. That's in the south of the United States. This is the north of the United States, northwest. And you'll see this is junk. This is absolute noise. And if something begins to emerge out of the signal, and it becomes coherent, and it gets bigger and bigger, and then this is junk again. Unfortunately, those two regions are junk. The same very similar thing happens in Hanford, in, 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 in Pacific Northwest. This is junk, and again, something emerges out of the junk, and you wind up again with junk at the end. And now you can superpose these two, and you get what made us somewhat confident that we had detected something very interesting. Because now you, you, what has been done, we've taken the two signals, and we delayed the signal from, uh, from Hanford by, we, 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 we made it, we, no, we delayed the signal from Louisiana by seven thousandth of a second. So we could put the two signals on top of each other. And now they're on top of each other. This is junk, but now you can see both signals. They're not perfect. There's noise. They look like they have very similar signals. And this is junk again. This is the first discovery of gravitational waves. And it was interpreted by... Uh, well, before I say interpret it, that's the next slide. But at first I want to say we, uh, there's another way to think about it because it's important for you to understand this second way of thinking about it. And that is that uh, this is now expressing the same thing in, t in time again. And here is that same time series as you saw before. This is so the southern, this is the western United States. But on top of that now, the axis is the frequency of the, su of the light in here. And now you plot, this is plotted. The brighter this is, the more of that frequency is in this signal. So for example, right here, 256 is middle C on the piano. And here is middle C on the piano and this same. And you can see something quite similar in these two things. They're not perfectly the same. And what if you could hear this, it would go whoop, whoop, like that. Whoop. That's all you'd hear, nothing very long. It'd be a little chirp, but a very, very short one. And what did we interpret that to be is actually this, pic this picture. And now, this has a story associated with this picture. The, although the experimental development was very profound to get to the point where we could measure 10 to the minus 21, um, the, the thing was there was another development that was just as important, which was the ability to solve the Einstein equations by computer. That's called numerical relativity. And it turns out the experimental development of these instruments was about parallel with the people learning how to program computers to do the Einstein equations. So it turns out here is the Einstein solution now of a, a thing which is two black holes, two with about 30 solar mass black holes going around each other at a distance from the Earth of about a billion light years, 10 to the 9 light years away. And here is the waveform that's made. We begin to see it out in here. And here at the end point, the two black holes have gotten close enough so they smash into each other and they make a new black hole. And this then is a waveform which matches the signal the best. And this comes from numerical relativity as well as also analytic calculations down in here. And so one of the gee whiz things about this is this curve right there, which shows you the this is now the time of the collision. And this tells you the velocity of the of the, the relative velocity between the two black holes as a function of time and in units of the velocity of light. So w when they crash into each other, these two objects, which are bigger than our sun, are moving very close to the velocity of light. It's sort of unbelievable when you get to the, the magnitude of what's going on in this collision. And that was our first experience. And what happened is none of us really believed it. It was too big. We didn't really expect it. And luckily, there were others. And this is what later, I mean, this is the event, we, this is the event we've been talking about. 
This is, again, 10 to minus 21 up in here. And this is the event we've just been talking about. There's another event, and you can identify when they were. This was in September of 14th of 2015. And in October 12th of 15, we had another event we were not so sure of. But then by Christmas of that year, this is, November, this is December 26th, the day after Christmas in the United States, they celebrate on the 25th, you had a signal that we all believed again. And now over here are the parameters of these signals. For example, the first one had masses of 36 and 29 solar masses in those in individual black holes, and three solar masses were thrown out into gravitational waves. At that moment, that collision for the very time it lasted, that 0.2 seconds in which it lasted, it was brighter than the entire universe, which is sort of amazing, brighter in terms of the energy per unit time that was being emitted. So that was an enormously powerful thing. And then you can see this for other ones we've seen now, different masses and the different amounts of radiation that went away. And we've now seen something like 10 of these. And uh, there's, so it's not that it's ordinary, it's still pretty spectacular. But there's one that is really very profound and very important to the whole field. And here is where one begins to get a feeling for multi-messenger astronomy. Because uh, an event that we saw in October 14th of, 19, of 2017 was seen not only by the United States detector, but was also seen by the Virgo detector. And the Virgo, and that made a profound difference in a place that, that we hadn't been paying enough attention to, or we couldn't do much with, and that's shown in this picture right here. This picture shows you sort of a sky map. Where in the sky was this, where did this black hole collision take place? It still took place 10 to the 9 years ago, but still we could not determine where it is better with LIGO alone, w with this sort of banana-shaped thing right here. And then when we found that, you could add now the fact that Virgo also saw it, and look at the timing differences between Virgo and the United States detectors, you could make a much smaller error bar right in here. You could, well, this was about 1,000 square degrees in the sky of uncertainty. This had now come down to the size of about 30 square degrees. Now, that's still, for most astronomers, a terribly big unknown. But it's a big step forward. And you'll see in, in the next thing we will talk about, it was profound and fundamental that Virgo was, was, was on the air. So this is the first detection with three detectors, and it, it made the ability to see the source where in the sky it was, ever so much better. And nobody yet has yet, who has had a telescope, has looked in any of the, for example, people looked in this era bar in here, and they didn't see anything. Now, maybe there shouldn't be anything seen from black holes colliding. I hope in the future, maybe we will see something from the black holes colliding. And maybe we will see something, for example, from something which I'm now about to show you next, which is, I think, one of the more spectacular things that happened in your lifetime, certainly in mine. But now it is, now that you know a little bit about how you interpret these signals, this is time, and this is the frequency of the gravitational wave, and now look at this thing. This goes for 10 seconds between here and there, and there is a signal that lasts for a very, very long time, and eventually it goes off the chart, we can't see it anymore, and it goes from whoop, like that, whoop, like that, that's what it does. I wish I could play it for you, but I can't. And so now here is what happens, it was also seen in a, in a gamma ray telescope that was on a satellite, the Fermi satellite. And here's where we thought the collision happened, right there. And the gamma ray telescope saw a gamma ray burst about 1.7 seconds later. There it is. And another instrument on the same satellite saw the same thing. And then a completely different satellite with another instrument also saw this. So now, all of a sudden, we had an electromagnetic counterpart to the gravitational wave signal. And now we know what that is. We believe it to be two neutron stars that have collided, and I'll get to that in a minute a little more. But first I want to show you the importance of Virgo and LIGO together. And what happened here, here's again a picture of the sky. And this picture of the sky has the uncertainties from, here's the bananas from LIGO alone, that's a banana and that banana. And here is the uncertainty of and it's a very interesting story here. And you should have people, Virgo, tell you this story. They did not see anything. That's sort of, but they, there is a circle of zero where you can't detect gravitational waves. That, that is a certain pattern of the antenna pattern of a, such a detector. That's a big L. 
And it turns out what we guessed, and they guessed too, is that they should have been sensitive enough to see it, and it must have therefore been in that zone of silence. And knowing that, you could make a circle now for where this source was, now adding Virgo's non-detection, which should have been there because we knew they were sensitive enough, in here, that spot was identified, right in there, someplace, somewhere in there. And here is sort of the uncertainty of the Fermi satellite. And it was much bigger than the uncertainty from the gravitational waves. That was enough information to have a whole bunch of telescopes start looking at it. And one of the most important ones was a telescope in the southern hemisphere that 20 days had, before this event had taken a picture of a galaxy. I don't, the galaxy's name is important to some people. I don't understand it. That's okay. And, uh, and here is this galaxy, and then here are stars in our own galaxy. And there you can see the th three stars. And then you look up about some number of hours, 10 hours after we made announcement that Virgo and LIGO had seen this. Lo and behold, there are the same stars. Here's that same galaxy. And now there is a hot spot right there. And that made all the difference. And people looked at that hot spot, and they found out a lot of information, a tremendous amount of information. Again, and this is the example, what I must say, where multi-messenger astronomy became a powerful tool because every element of that message came from different places and all of it, when put together, made a much better understanding of what was actually being found. And so here's the thing that is the model for what was being seen. Here are two neutron stars. By the way, I didn't explain neutron stars to you. Neutron stars are stars that are about the mass of the sun, but they're only about the size of a city like Bologna. I mean, imagine something. They're enormously dense. They have a density of 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cubed, at least, maybe a little more than that. You couldn't put a teaspoon into it and measure its weight. You couldn't lift a, you couldn't lift a teaspoon. Just out of question. So here are these two neutron stars. They have collided. They're about to make a new black hole, but before they do that, they emit a gamma ray burst at an angle, and on top of that, they have this huge mess of nuclear material that's all around them and they make something called a kilonova. And that kilonova is a place where a lot of things were discovered. People watched this kilonova for a while. With telescopes, for some number of weeks they watched it. They watched it decay, Then people with radio telescopes saw a jet form, so they knew that was a black hole, and then people with gamma ray telescopes again, x-ray telescopes, excuse me, saw the same thing. So the whole evolution of that picture was sort of seen, but here's sort of an interesting one. And this is something people ought to know just because it's a standard piece of chemistry, but this is the periodic table. And the periodic table, which you probably learned in chemistry or maybe you've learned in high school, in grade school, maybe in the United States kids learn about this in high school. So they have a color code, which you don't normally see on a periodic table. Everything that's blue was made in the big explosion that made the universe. And everything green and yellow was made in, subsequently in stars. And you'll see stuff that is purple in here, and that was made in merging neutron stars. And now you'll notice something interesting. The things that were made in the initial explosion where we know about is hydrogen and helium. That's the two things we know about. But then most of the rest of the stuff, all the stuff, we're, a little bit of lithium, but most of the stuff we're made of and interesting stuff is all made in the stars and then thrown out in supernova, as you heard before in the other lecture. But people did not have a good concept how you made the things heavier than iron. And here, for example, some favorite things that men adore, uh, you know, gold and platinum, seem to be all of it, or at least we think right now much of it, maybe not, maybe all of it, is made in neutron star explosion. And, and that's where the density of neutrons would be high enough to do this. So, that's one discovery. I think I'm going to go over this to hell with this one, and I want to go to the, where we're going to wind up. And this is actually so you can imagine where will gravitational wave astronomy be at the time when the, the Sherenkov telescope array is actually operating. So this is a picture which is a little more subtle. It's really for the experts, but I'll just quickly tell you. The better the detector is, the better you go down in this. The more sensitive it is, the more you go down. Here is the frequency of the signal you might be looking at. And here is, here, here is, a, uh, here is a, a, a one kilohertz. Here is 100 hertz, middle C is right about there. And you can see that the, here is, for example, with the current state of Virgo. And it's making detections right now, as is LIGO. But it's up in here, and they're getting better. Here is where LIGO was in 2017, where we made all these discoveries. And we worked very, very hard in the last two years to try to make an improvement. And here's where we are now, 
at, on LIGO, but we made no improvement at low frequencies. We made some improvement here by using techniques which I'll go into in a lecture tomorrow. Uh, here is the design sensitivity for LIGO. It's, it's below, that's where it's supposed to be, and we're not there yet. And here is something we have planned for the future in about middle 20s of this next decade called LIGO Plus. And Virgo has a plan for Virgo Plus. And down in here, way below, this is now a huge factor down, it's a factor almost 10 down, are two ideas that are both emergent in Italy and in France, as well as in the United States. And that is to make a gravitational wave detector that is not four kilometers long, but 40 kilometers long. And that are the, those are the curves for this. And I'll show you some of the things that would come from having made such a detector. And this is a very pretty little picture that shows this. Uh, this is a picture which shows you the redshift is the radial distance. So for example, a redshift of one is about there, 10 over here, 100 over there. And this picture over here are all the black holes that we believe are in the universe. They end right about at a redshift of about 10, we think. We're not sure of that. But here are the detectors. Here's A+. Plus. This is the best we can do now. We get some of them. But if you go to A+, plus, which is that which is being done both by Virgo and by LIGO, you would get right into the middle of this distribution of black holes. But if you build these 40 kilometer things, you're way outside. You will have detected all the black hole binaries in the universe. That's spectacular. And over here are the neutron stars, the things that made all the fuss just recently. And again, here you have to build a little better. You have to go even better than the first cosmic explorer, which is the 40 kilometer. You have to do the very best we can to get all the, black, all the neutron stars. That's a very pretty picture to show what the future, future might have. And uh, here is the last slide. Um, and this is sort of, I give you a feeling of where the field is right now. And what we've been talking about is, this is, oh, let me tell you what this is first. This is frequency of gravitational waves this way. Here, for example, is uh, 10, 10 kilohertz. There's one hertz. Here is 10 to the minus four hertz. So you can do it up here with time, minutes, hours, years, the age of the universe, all the way over here. So this is time going older and older. This is frequency getting smaller and smaller. And here is strain. So for example, here's what we've been talking about, and these are the sources you know a little about now. There's another project, which is a space project called LISA, which is the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, which has sort of sensitivity from hours to minutes. And it will look at the black holes like the one in the middle of our galaxy a million mass black hole, things falling into it. It will also look at white dwarf stars going around each other. And it's a very completely different frequency. This is a short, these are short wavelengths, these are much longer wavelengths. Then there's another project going on right now, which is using pulsars in our own galaxy to measure gravitational waves that are coming through our galaxy. And for example, the measurement consists of looking at all the pulsars in the northern sky and all the pulsars in the southern sky. And if you notice that all the ones in the northern sky and the southern sky have speeded up a little bit in their pulsing, and the ones in the east and west have slowed down in their pulsing, you may have detected a gravitational wave of a very long period that's coming through our own galaxy. And they're looking like that with radio telescopes. And that hasn't yet succeeded, but it's a very nice experiment. And then this experiment is probably the most dramatic of all. This is an experiment that thought they had a result about three, four years ago. They were looking at attributes of the big explosion that made the universe. And the electromagnetic radiation comes from that very early days. And people were looking at the way the electric fields point in that radiation. And there would be patterns in the way the electric field go points, namely the polarization of that, those waves, which would look like, spir like little, uh, uh, sp little spirals. And that if they have that pattern, or more, I mean, when, I don't, what are the things that people, when they blow on them, they turn? Uh, I, can't, I can't get the word right now. For a, a thing that kids blow into and they spin. Sp spin wheel, spinning wheels, okay, never mind. Uh, the, anyway, that, that pattern would be seen in these, and they thought they had seen this pattern, and, they, and what would that pattern be due to? It would be due to primordial gravitational waves that were made very, very long ago, way before anything was, any matter was created, way before any stars were made. And hopefully we may, might someday see that it coming from the origin, the very moment the universe was created. 
Now, these people thought they saw this about two, three years ago, and unfortunately what they were seeing is the polarization by dust in our own galaxy. But they're still working on it, and I hope they see something. So thank you. <laughs>